dear friends, colleagues and comrades around the world, wherever you might be. Here we are again on our uh, dialogue series sponsored by the Agrarian South Network, uh, the Samoyo African Institute for Agrarian Studies in Zimbabwe and Action Aid India. Uh, the theme of our series, as you well know, is uh, Specters of Crisis, Rays of Hope. This is a fortnightly event. Uh, today's topic will be on um, uh, coronavirus crisis or a new stage of the global crisis of capitalism. We are very honored and pleased to have with us Professor Arturo Guillen uh, from Mexico City. I will introduce uh, Professor Guillen in a moment. Uh, uh, as for discussant, we also have today uh, Professor Archana Prasad from uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University in, 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 uh, in Delhi. Um, before we do the introductions, uh, let me just um, I'll tell you a bit more about the, this dialogue series. Uh, we are a, a tricontinental network, uh, which has been in operation for at least 10 years now or more. Uh, this idea of a dialogue series was our response to the crisis that's been unfolding, which is uh, as much uh, an economic crisis uh, already established for many years uh, as a pandemic crisis. Uh, and this is precisely the talk today that uh, Professor Guyen uh, will, will speak to. Um, our supporting partners for this event are the Center for Informal and Labor Studies at JNU in India, uh, the Institute of African Studies at the University of Ghana, uh, the Global University for Sustainability in Hong Kong, China, the Poster Program in World Political Economy, uh, at the Uni Federal University of ABC in Brazil, as well as the Educational Technologies and Languages Unit at the same university. Um, the, our dialogues are in English, um, and uh, you can send however questions in whatever other languages you feel comfortable with, and within our capacities, we will translate these questions uh, on the chat um, or on Facebook and uh, forward them to Professor Guyen. Uh, so please write your questions and they will be forwarded. The, we are recording this, uh, this session as always. And um, uh, after the session, we are translating um, these sessions into Portuguese and Spanish with uh, subtitles. And uh, they, they appear later on in uh, these two languages as well. Yes. Um, so without further uh, ado on my part, let me go straight to, to say a few words about Professor Guyen. He's senior professor in the Department of Economics, postgraduate program in social studies at the, at the Autonomous uh, Metropolitan University, uh, East Apalapa campus in Mexico City. Yeah. Uh, professor Guyen, in fact, was uh, a uh, uh, professor in our, in our university here in Sao Paulo uh, last year. So we had uh, the pleasure of having him with us and having the benefit of his uh, uh, contribution in our own program here. He's also the uh, general coordinator of Tado Network for Development Studies. Yeah. He received his PhD in economics at the Central School of Planning and Statistics of Warsaw, Poland. He has published widely on the Mexican economy, financial economics, international uh, economy, and development theory. The author of uh, several books, I will just, uh, uh, and many articles, I will just uh, mention here um, the uh, most recent one uh, uh, in 2015, The Global Crisis in its, uh, Labyrinth. This is uh, the title in Spanish, uh, Mexico in the 21st Century. Crisis and Economic and Alternative Economic Model. Uh, that was in 2010. Myth and Reality of Neoliberal Globalization, uh, 2007. Problems of the Mexican Economy in 86. Imperialism and the Law of Value in 1981. Um, and I believe that was the title of, of, uh, of your PhD uh, thesis, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, that's true. Yes, yeah. yes, 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 yes. 
Um, and uh, before that, even the uh, economic um, planning in Mexico. So we are very pleased to have you with us, Professor Guyen. It's a great pleasure. Um, the uh, Professor Archana Prasad uh, has um, is is a regular on this uh, on this series. Thank you again, Archana, for being with us. Uh, Archana Prasad is professor at the Center for Informal Sector and Labor Studies at JNU in New Delhi. Uh, she was also the chairperson of this between 2014 and 2000. She specializes in uh, research on the contemporary of um, Adivasi communities on labor and resistance on women and labor and environmental and labor uh, history. She uh, is uh, uh, fully involved in, uh, in um, mobilizing grassroots organizations. Uh, she is uh, a scholar activist Par excellence, she uh, is also editor, associate editor of the Agrarian South uh, Journal of Political Economy. Her books um, have uh, been on environmental uh, issues and uh, um, uh, Adivasi history, such as Against Ecological Romanticism, this was in 2011, Environmentalism in the Left in 2004, The Red Flag of the Wireless, A History of an Ongoing Struggle, this is in 2017. Um, this is a co-authored book with Sarika Chaudhuri. Um, uh, and uh, also, no, sorry, this next one is the co-authored book, Struggling for Nation Building, a History of the All Bank Office, All India Bank Offices Association. This is 2018. So Arjuna, uh, thank you for being with us once again. And uh, without uh, further, uh, taking further time on my, on my part, let's move directly to uh, Professor Guyen's presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning for everybody. And thank you very much for your invitation to participate in this very interesting uh, dialogue about the crisis and for invitation to, to the network, your important network. Uh, the title of my paper is Coronavirus is Coronavirus Crisis or a New Stage of the Global Crisis of Capitalism. Then uh, the first point I want to, to, to remark is about the, the nature. You, you can put the next. Next. Okay, thank you. The first idea I want to, to transmit is the, is the following. The, for me, the current economic crisis is the third great post-war crisis. That means it's not a psychical uh, crisis as we know in the development of capitalism, but a great crisis similar to, 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 what, to, to that of, uh, of the 30s or, or or the crisis uh, at the end of the uh, 19th century. Um, uh, after the, the war, for me, we can uh, talk about three, three crises. Uh, first, the crisis of the 70s, which, which is called the crisis of for this accumulation regime. It's a very important crisis, I think, because this crisis put an end to the long post-war boom and meant the transition to neoliberalism. Neoliberalism, in my opinion, is the, as a model, as a regime of accumulation, is, uh, is caused by the problems uh, occur during this crisis of the 70s. Um, the capitalists, uh, after this crisis, develop a, a series of, uh, of processes in order to, 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 to find an exit 
of the crisis uh, and, and this process in, in, in synthesis can uh, we can mention the globalization productive globalization commercial trade globalization and mainly uh, financial um, globalization after the consensus of Washington and then this is the first crisis of the post-war period the second one is the global economic financial crisis of uh, 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 2007 the subprime crisis and you know is one of the most important crises occurring capitalists during the last years uh, in my opinion this crisis never was solved sufficiently uh, uh, the governments and central banks uh, participates very actively in the economic process and they 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 avoid a depression similar to the 30s but at the same time they they couldn't uh, uh, push a uh, recovery really important in the in the operation of capitalists this is the second one and the third uh, crisis i mentioned is the current crisis the so-called coronavirus crisis many people utilize this this name coronavirus crisis even donald trump and the president of the united states and many uh, big uh, um, functionaries or economists from the mainstream who call this crisis as a coronavirus crisis for me is is an ideological uh, name uh, uh, looking for uh, to justify the crisis uh, the idea behind this 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 name is that capitalist was functioning very well before pandemic appears and then for uh, this crisis in his opinion is everything was okay capitalism was recovering and now with this coronavirus made in china in china this is the definition of trump also and many other politicians and and functionaries uh, i if you can put the next to the next uh, the next uh, next slide yes next slide no the, the, the next next because i think it's interesting no 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 the, this um, quote of powell no 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 <laughs> sorry no, no it's the, the second or the third the one the, the, yeah please from the beginning this this one this one this. the quote no. one next more, one more one more one more okay this. yes no no i think the quote. oh the quote the quote before yeah, yeah. That, <laughs> that's all right <laughs> thank you very much uh, powell said the current recession is attributable to the virus and the measures taken to limit its consequence. This time, he said, the problem has not been high inflation, neither the threat of bursting a bubble that threatens the economy, neither stopping an unsustainable boom. The cause is the virus, not the usual suspects something we're bearing in mind in how we respond then the crisis is the crisis of coronavirus not an economical crisis caused by the contradictions of capitalism we can 
And then in my opinion, with all the importance of the coronavirus, coronavirus and the costs involved in, 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 in its containment, they are not enough to explain the current economic crisis, nor are they its root causes. In any case, they are only detonators, three triggers of the crisis, not the cause, not the efficient cause of the present crisis. In my opinion, it's not a coronavirus crisis, but a new stage of the crisis of capitalism. Blaming the coronavirus is more than anything an ideological construction of the hegemonic sectors, sectors of the financial oligarchy and the media at their service, that means the majority means, to high the contradictions of the capitalist systems, the undeterminable profiles of its reproduction in order to confuse population. That's my point of, of the part of this, uh, uh, of this paper. And then what will happen with capitalists before coronavirus? Uh, many people, not only me and other professors present here, uh, uh, we think that this crisis of capitalists, mainly the 2007 uh, crisis, which uh, provokes a, a tremendous uh, financial uh, crisis, is not so only an economic, economic crisis, but a civilizatory crisis. So how, how to say is, is a multi, multidimensional crisis. It's not only economic, it's not only financial, but it's also ecological, is a crisis of uh, um, energetic, the, the limits of, uh, uh, energetic model by, based on, on on fuels and, and uh, another crisis. This is a multi-dimensional uh, uh, crisis which uh, concur, which uh, uh, coincide on, on time. The, uh, from the economic point of view, uh, I consider that the contradictions in the economic field untied by the economic financial crisis from 2000, 2007, no, they were not resolved, but only postponed since then. These trends violently burst onto the surface with this new crisis. Uh, what a, what I, can, uh, I want to say that there are uh, uh, a series of uh, trends present in capitalism during the last de decades and who are um, uh, each time worse. For example, I, I, I quote the the following facts. First, the hegemonic decline of the United States and its role in rivalry with China and other regional powers, for example, Russia, Iran, Turkey. Uh, Turkey is very interesting to, to follow what, what is happening in, in this region because uh, in, uh, Turkey is. Uh, each time most far from the uh, Atlantic Alliance and, 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 and other uh, groups of uh, capitalist organizations. Then in the hegemonic decline as a very important factor. Jin is now the leader of the, of the economy is the productive leader, is uh, 
the trail leader and uh, each time more is a very important uh, factor in the export of capital to other countries. Then first, the hegemonic decline. Second, the trend towards economic extension present since the 80s, I think is very important. Capitalism, since many decades ago, is growing a very slow rate of growth. Each time is worse, I think. Even after the even after the uh, crisis of 2007. Third, the persistence of deflationary trends linked to increasing indebtedness. This is very, very clear. The rate of inflation in, in the United States is uh, um, about 1.5%. Uh, the objective of the central bank of the Fed to 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 rise the the rate of inflation uh, at uh, two 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 percent level is not uh, achieved, and then we we have in the in the in the whole system not only in the United States but in Europe, Japan and other countries uh, uh, persistence of these uh, deflationary trends. Fourth fact, uh, a process of deglobalization, which is reinforced by the growing protection of governments, this tendency of many very important governments of the capitalist world, uh, the United States, uh, Great Britain and, and others, in order to 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 try to 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 revert the process of globalization present since uh, since the 70s. No? Now, after a very intense process of globalization during the neoliberal era, now we 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 see a tendency to to close the economies to to establish protectionist measures, et cetera, et cetera. And finally, and the, the, the last trend present in, in capitalism before the, the virus is the unstoppable financialization, or in more precise terms, the existence and exacerbations of an accumulation regime dominated by finance. Uh, I am um, taking here the, this, uh, this concept uh, proposed by Professor Francois Chesney uh, many years ago. Um, but I think the, this uh, regime is present and even more present than before in, in, in the functioning of capitalists not only in developed countries, but also in developing countries as Brazil, Mexico, uh, and another uh, third world countries of, of the world. Next, please. <clears throat> now I talk uh, a little about the policies implemented to exit from the 2000s seven global crisis. To overcome the great recessions of 2008 and 2009, it was not enough to lower interest rates to zero. This was uh, a reality in, in, the, in, 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 in most of the countries, but still it was essential to venture into unknown waters as uh, ben Bernanke said uh, many years ago, by implementing quantitative easing programs that flooded the system with liquidity. Uh, 
they tried in some moment to 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 reverse this process uh, they talk about normalization of monetary policy and we need to 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 to, to rise the rate of inflation we we need to 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 co to come back to 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 the normal in order to 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 confront the problems of of the system this uh, objective was never uh, reached and i think the much feared depression was avoided but the productivity the, the revival of production was mediocre the u.s economy failed to exceed the 2000 annual growth threshold and the performance of the rest of the developed countries was even worse investment rate did not reactivate despite the sea of liquidity and the reduction of taxes decreed, decreed by Trump's own administration. Then stagnation is, was the situation before the pandemic. And at the same time, I think the, one of the most important facts, the accumulation regime dominated by finance remain intact no important uh, changes in regulation uh, policies was was made and that means fi finally business as usual and we live in a world on, on uh, where a speculative uh, uh, capital is dominate the process of accumulation of, of capital Next, please. And for these reasons, for due to extension and due to deflationary trends, contrary to who was expected, expected at the end of 2008, in that economic, uh, 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 the idea that economic agents will reduce their level of indebtedness, the, ex the, ex the, the opposites really happen. At the end of 2019, total debt reached 330% of world GDP, well above the 269% of, uh, it had in in 2007 that means the level of debt now is superior at that which existed before the former crisis of 2007 uh, and now i would like to to to, to propose this this idea uh, many Keynesian and post Keynesians economies sustain that uh, the, 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 the exit of the crisis is uh, simply speaking uh, to, 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 to expand, to, to expand the uh, public, uh, uh, public expenditures to uh, to exit from the, from the crisis through fiscal policies and there is no limits to to that uh, and they mention after the war we have a very high level of debt and nobody in, 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 nothing happens the, the formula is uh, capitalism must grow again and I think that the idea that there are no limits to debt is an intrinsical, uh, in, in an intrinsical system, okay, capitalism is an intrinsical system of debt, it, it is false. Debt limits are determined, uh, that means for me, 
it is false the idea that they don't have limits they are objective limits and the main limit is uh, the process of capital valorization which depends finally on the production of surplus value in the production process and, I, and here i transmit a, a idea taken from uh, i think is very interesting economist michael hudson which refute this this thesis and he, uh, he says thinking that debt can grow without restrictions would be the same as believing that money is neutral which is another way to say as Keynes claim that supply creates its own demand according to Hudson see if Keynesians say that money is not neutral then debt is a form of money debt is not neutral and then uh, debt matters for the functioning of capitalists it is not uh, a process without limits but con with objective limits for its continuation now some uh, some ideas about the current recessions and the policies followed by the governments and central banks every everybody know that the present recession is very deep world gdp will decrease according to the emf it will decrease 4.4 in 2020 that means seven percentage points more than in 2019 is 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 the 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 fall in the fall more important than in the last since the great depression uh, for these reasons most governments and central banks in developed countries acted quickly and implemented quantitative easing the response was very quickly in order to to inject liquid liquidity uh, the fed lowered the benchmark interest rate to almost zero at the same time implemented both bond, bond purchases programs totaling six trillion dollars well above the resources allocated during the great recessions the former great recession and european central bank and the bank of japan were approved similar measures according to the emf the assets added uh, to the balance sheets of the central banks of the group of seven amounted to around six trillion dollars which represents 15 percent of the gdp of these countries this is the, the quantity of money put in the in 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 in, in the hands of central banks then normalization of monetary policy is, is a dream it doesn't exist it not uh, it, i will not exist in the future powell in the fed has said the at least three years more of quantitative easing And then to summarize, which are the effects of the present recession? Uh, first, the deepening of deflationary trends in, in the majority of the economies, even in, in, in inter-world economies. Uh, Mexico is, is, is a rate of inflation about three, four percent. 
I don't know how is the situation now in, in Brazil. Maybe in Argentina, due to the devaluation of, of, of the peso, the situation is worse. But in general, the the trend the trend is no not inflationary, but deflationary in, in all the, the world. At the same time, each time higher and higher levels of debt. And I think that this, uh, the continuation of this crisis, and this crisis will continue for many, many months at least, uh, mientras, uh, <laughs> while uh, the pandemic is not controlled, is not a, a remedy to, 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 to stop it. And um, for these reasons, we, we have this dual situation. Um, in the United States, the pandemic is growing and growing without control. In Europe, the, uh, uh, the pandemic is reinvigorated now in many countries. The only country which really control the coronavirus is China. And at the same time, China is the only economy which is growing in this year. Not at the same level as before, but very near to the level before, about 6% a year. Not this year, but probably next year, the GDP growth in, in China will be about 6% as before. At the same time, we observe that financialization continues its unstoppable march. Uh, uh, we uh, examine the, 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 the behavior of the stock exchange, it's is, is evident this, this uh, incredible uh, uh, speculation in, in, mar in financial markets. Yeah. That is always a, a, a problem which uh, will appear after. And finally, uh, about the discussion if uh, this crisis means the, the end of neoliberalism, neoliberal, I think the response the the answer is not at this time not for economic uh, reasons for the way of operation of, of of monopoly financial capital not for political reasons also because i don't think there exists an alternative sufficiently uh, radical and and organized to to confront the problems which we confront of course, it will be changes, but not the end of neoliberalism. And I sustain that because for me, and for many others, neoliberalism is not only a set of economic policies, but also an accumulation re regime, which is based on a power structure the power of monopoly financial capital that remains intact in all the world, even in our countries. And, and very rapidly, I, I finish with that. This is uh, a table about GDP growth. You can see the only uh, economy in this second quarter who is growing is China, Hong Kong, which is part of, uh, obviously of China, is very near of growth, and the situation in other, in other capitalist countries. In the US, second quarter, Japan, Eurozone, uh, 14 minus 14.7 growth 
Next, please. This is the same. <laughs> this is the tendency. That's, sorry. No, no. This one. Is GDP growth, China. Improving, Hong Kong, US, Japan, Eurozone. Next, please. This is a, a, a figure in order to show how the process of deglobalization is, is advancing. You can see the, the more affected for deglobalization, of course, is China, because it was or it is a very open uh, economy, most affected for for the globalization. Uh, Hong Kong, much much more also. But at the same time, in other countries, the, the, after the two thousands seven crisis, you can see a very clear tendency to deglobalize. That means exports of goods. Trade globalization is reversing. It's, this uh, figure is about the export of goods and service as a percentage of GDP. In all the regions there, uh, there is present a process of deglobalization, but it's different in Europe. That means that the uh, in, uh, European integration is contributing to 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 to, to do this tendency most uh, not, not not so pronounced as in other parts of, of, of the world. Next, please. This is interesting because is the figure of of all the world. Of course, after the eighties, the tremendous process of globalization in all the world. This is merchandise trade as a percentage of GDP. But the interesting thing is how after the 2007 crisis, it begins globalization, the process of rapid globalization finish, and it starts a process of deglobalization very clear show, I think, in this figure. Next. This is about deflationary trends. The rate of inflation in the US, Japan, Germany, and Eurozone. Yes, and the tendency is very clear. Actually, the, the, the rate of inflation now in the main capitalist country is very near to, to zero. Next, another form to see deflation the rate of interest of 10-year bonds, the same, USA, US, Japan, and Germany, three of the main capitalist countries, or the main capitalist centers. And the rate of, uh, of interest of these bonds is zero or, or less than zero in many countries and tend to zero even in the United States. Now it's about, uh, I don't have the, the, the last time, but it's, it's less than 1%, no? See, it's 80 uh, percentage points. Next, CI, was the, uh, this is interesting also. Is ma major central banks, total assets, and you can see the, the, the process. Crisis of 2007, 
the assets in hands of central banks increase, increase, increase very rapidly. Then when the recovery uh, starts, this process tends to stabilize in, in the majority of the banks. In others, it continues. For example, the, the Central Bank of Europe, European Central Banks, it is stabilized, but now, after the coronavirus crisis, assets of the banks, they increase and increase very rapidly, even more rapidly than during the former crisis. And next, that is all the banks, and you can see the same tendency, increasing stabilization and then a rapid a process of increasing total assets that continues at the present and it will continue until the crisis is present. And then I think is the last last figure. I ah it's interesting also is this the last one. This is uh, please the, the last percent permanent job losses in three periods, 2001 as a NASDAQ, NASDAQ crisis, 2007 and 2020. And you can see how the, the loss of, of permanent uh, jobs is now worse than the former crisis in very important crisis of capitalism. It's true that many people is returning to, to work grace uh, to, 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 to these measures of, of reduce the, the uh, how do you say in English? Uh, that they are coming to, to, to work, but not at uh, the same ring that the situation now is worse, I think, uh, is worse than, than the former crisis. But that's all, and thank you very much for your invitation, and I hope we can exchange uh, some ideas about this paper. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Arturo. Thank you very much indeed for uh, a broad uh, uh, you know, picture of um, the main tendencies that have been ongoing for many years now in the um, in the evolution of the new liberal regime. Yeah, I will. Uh, we will come. I have uh, so many questions myself that uh, and comments that I would, but I will just refrain, of course. And I will pass on, pass the, uh, give the, the mic to uh, Professor Archana Prasad to uh, provide uh, her own comments before we open up for a larger um, uh, exchange. Thank you, Archana. So um, I think uh, that Professor Green provided a really good account of the structural changes and the crisis within capitalism. Uh, I wish some more of my students had been attending to listen to that account. It was really a uh, very uh, interesting account uh, and something not, that we're not totally unfamiliar with, but many of our present generation is quite unfamiliar with. And uh, 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 I'd like to sort of raise a couple of points which uh, will make the professor sort of explain a little more some of the issues which I think he could not explain because of the length of the presentation. And apart from that, I'd also like to raise 
some issues that maybe he could uh, respond to, especially taking off from some of the slides that he showed in the end and some of the comments, the very, very interesting comments that he made uh, about the limits to capitalism. Uh, so the first uh, uh, point that I dare to take off from is, I think one of the central pieces of the argument that Professor Gus made was that the loss of hegemony of the US. And I'd like to sort of ask him how he sees the world order. I'm saying post pandemic only because the pandemic has worsened the crisis to a large extent and exposed the crisis to a large extent. I tend to agree with him that the crisis was obviously there and coming. But, mm, uh, but in the post, say, one year or six months, what changes are we likely to see in the power relations in the world and what implications it has for the South, for the countries with the relationship of the countries within the South and between the so-called North and the South. So that's uh, one issue that I'd like to, uh, uh, that I'd like him to sort of elaborate on a little more. The second uh, uh, issue that i like uh, some clarity on is that uh, the argument is that there are limits to capitalism but we don't see an end in sight. So my question is that in his experience, what kinds of responses should people's movements have so that the contradictions can be worsened and a sort of a pathway to a new world or a more or a better world can be imagined. So uh, what I'm really asking is, is the path to an alternative to capitalism, how does he see that? And related to that is that it's obvious and everybody knows it, that there are deepening inequities that have arisen. And instead of a V-shaped curve that his paper talks about, what you have is a K-shaped growth, which Jyoti Ghosh also mentioned at, uh, in her lecture. And uh, the deepening and the reconfiguration of the inequality in the world, what kind of uh, characteristics do we see of that inequality? And what are the kind of social factors that have played an important role, maybe from his part of the world? And how does he see this inequality panning out in terms of politics? That is uh, the third issue I wanted to raise. And related to that issue is also the crisis of social reproduction that has arisen because of these uh, 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 because of these growing inequalities because in effect uh, what we are seeing and I think that you pointed this out in the very last slide on employment uh, you pointed this out is that in effect what we are seeing is a burgeoning an even more burgeoning labor reserve and what does that mean for an alternative politics. How do we sort of creatively look at the role of this labor reserve, both in the North and in the South? What should be uh, its role and what is its character? I mean, for example, in India, I can say that even today, a large part of the labor reserve is women, for example. 
for example uh, uh, the uh, lower caste or the uh, most marginalized historically marginalized people uh, are uh, are really at the most uh, uh, at the most deprived end of the labor reserve so uh, uh, the point that i'm making is this uh, this kind of tendency over maybe the last two decades has seen the growth of a lot of identity politic which, politics which also has its limits yeah because the crisis throws up uh, a whole lot of identity politics and various kinds of political formulations and class politics has to negotiate that uh, uh, that slippery and contradictory and i mean a very difficult terrain so what are the sort of uh, vision what kind of a class movement do you think that the class based movements themselves need to reinvent themselves in order to respond to this uh, crisis uh, so that was the fourth point uh, that i like to make and lastly uh, i think uh, there was one side and one point uh, uh, where you mentioned the energy crisis, uh, the energy crisis with the economic crisis. And I think uh, perhaps if you could elaborate on the politics of uh, climate change and the uh, different ways in which the ecological crisis is actually feeding into capitalism, that would also uh, be quite useful. So I think I'll stop there, Paris. Thank you, Archana. Thank you very much. Uh, you've also uh, put a lot on the table. So let's um, uh, go back to Arturo before we uh, open up um, to the rest of the group. We have many questions that are coming in. So let's get Arturo's uh, initial response before we we'll move on. Please, Arturo. I respond? Me? Paris? Yes, Arturo. If you want to respond to Ar yes, if you want to respond to Archana, uh, you know, in minutes, uh, then we can open up for the questions coming okay. in. Okay. Thank you. Okay. If I understand well, your 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 point of view. I think it's mainly uh, about uh, what responses we can do to to this catastrophic situation in our countries, mainly in the south, no? if I understand well. At the level uh, of the, the, the developed countries, Europe, United States, Japan, I think the possibilities of important changes is very limited. And in the United States, even if uh, Biden won win the elections, I think the the possible change is very very limited. Uh, is a person very close to Wall Street? I don't think that there will be many changes in, in terms of of neoliberal policies. Maybe some social response, some social programs to to reduce the effects of the crisis, but but not more than that. We don't know what will happen with the with the movement around Bernie Sanders and the Joan uh, representatives of Democrats, so Casio Cortez and others representatives. And we, we don't know who, which is the, the future of these movements or so Black Lives Matters. Uh, 
they are very important, uh, obviously, political movements. But I think we cannot wait a very important changes in the neither in, in the political uh, outlook, neither in, in the uh, economic uh, policies. About the South, I think it, uh, I, I talk about um, Latin America. I, I, I don't know, and I prefer not to, to comment without uh, knowledge of the situation in other countries, India or, or other continents. But in Latin America, I, I think it, we we observe two two, two main uh, uh, types of movements which can uh, uh, change some things in in Latin America. In one on one side, the 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 rise again of some left governments or reformists or populists, if you want, po uh, governments in Latin America, Mexico with uh, López Obrador, Argentina with Fernández, and now Bolivia with the uh, uh, triumph of, uh, of mass. Uh, I think for our countries it's very difficult to, to to construct an an alternative agenda to 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 exit from the crisis, because all our countries are part of this network of financial globalization, and, and is the 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 main uh, how to say is the main change which in, uh, limit the possibility of change of these governments. And it's, it's a fight I think is very important. And for me, the, 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 the capacity of this government to change depends, of course, of the capacity to construct a new hegemony in, 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 in the power. Uh, because uh, the dominant class is, is, as in other parts of the world, is the financial capital, and it's not easy to 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 to, to exit of this of this network of uh, which uh, globalization provokes in our country. This is one part, uh, and on the other uh, on the other side there is a, a growing. Uh, um, increase of movements at the local level in, in all our countries, uh, the peasants, people from the cities, uh, in indigenous uh, communities, as for example, Zapatistas in Mexico, but many people who just resisting uh, is making resistance to to many projects and uh, and so on, and then uh, there are responses, but at the same time, uh, the level of uh, uh, of change we can obtain is, I think, very limited. About the uh, energetic crisis i think we 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 we, we confront a, a very difficult situation uh, uh, the ecological crisis is uh, really a, a collapse of the uh, of the como se dice medio ambiente of the ecological uh, situation uh, of course the the fuels is, is a resource without uh, possibility of 
of continuo, es, es uh, un recurso limitado, como decimos en español, es un recurso no renovable. Petrol resources. Will, uh, yeah. Petrol resources, they, they, they have a limit, but very precise. And at the same time, this, this situation provokes more uh, uh, ecological problems because to increase fuels production implies uh, more uh, ecological problems, fracking, etc., etc. And then, uh, of course, the ecological uh, fight is. is uh, lucha ecológica is, is very important, but at the same time, it, it requires a transformation of power. Uh, I think the finally that the, that the main uh, obstacle to to change in in our world, in our countries, in third world countries, is fundamentally political and the capacity of people and and movements and parties and governments to to transform uh, uh, this situation in a in a different one. Thank you, Arturo. Um, <clears throat> we have a number of questions that are coming in. Um, I will just uh, try to group them so that uh, you can uh, answer them. Uh, uh, the way you want. Uh, some of them are quite similar, others are, are, um, are very diverse. One question by Bill Martin, for example, uh, refers to the divergence between um, the North Atlantic, you know, uh, US and Europe, and uh, Northeast Asia, China, and so forth. Um, Bill Martin says, uh, China stands out uh, given the configuration of state finance and private capital, um, which uh, breaks with the conceptions of uh, the North Atlantic economies and uh, ideas. Um, most of the analysis of the crisis rests on uh, European American patterns of uh, financialization. Does this hold also for uh, China? Uh, and um, at the same time for relations between China and the South? That's one question. So that uh, the, the question of financialization, how to apply to, to China. In fact, uh, you know, a few weeks ago, we had here our, our colleagues from China, Sitsui and uh, Qin Chi Lao, who spoke to this uh, uh, quite a bit. So it's an ongoing question. Uh, another question, um, I think you addressed uh, already, but maybe you can, uh, uh, address again in uh, maybe in, in the context of Mexico more specifically or in the context of Bolivia which is undergoing um, a resurgence yeah, of, uh, of mobilization. Uh, what will be the main consequences of the crisis for Latin America? That's just a broad question. I think you've answered some of it here and there but if you can just uh, tell us what you think, where it's, the changes are coming from um, and what the, the future is of this. Uh, also on the Bolivian government. Yeah. Um, what do you advise the Bolivian government, um, the new Bolivian government, uh, given that it, it has to impose austerity or, you know, consider austerity measures as a result of the debt burden they are facing? What are the policy alternatives? So that's a specific question to indebted country, regarding indebted countries and Bolivia in particular which want to go a different direction. Then this is by Hibis Casa, this question. Uh, the, the previous one, general question on Latin America was by Brianda uh, Rubio. There's uh, two questions uh, similar by Aaron Garcia and Domingo Alvarez. Um, what can be done about the economic situation? I think it goes back to the same, uh, uh, given that there's, uh, that there's a debt trap generally, how do we exit from this trap and from this economic disaster? Um, and uh, there's one, there's more questions, but let me just, uh, put, I don't, I mean, I don't want to put too much on this round. We'll come back. Okay. Then uh, I answer. Okay. 
Well, about China, I, I can tell some things. Of course, uh, there is a relationship between China and the rest of capitalist world. Uh, one author talk about uh, codependence. There is a symbiosis between China and the United States. Now they are mainly enemies, but at the same time, the relationships are very strong. China economy has depended on the United States in many things. And at the same time, the United States depend a lot of uh, Chinese economy and in general, the, the economies of the third world, uh, mainly in terms of rate of profit, uh, Not, 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 not uh, only the the, the political, the macroeconomic policy, uh, as uh, for example, new development is sustain uh, how to to change the rate of exchange, uh, the, the 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 exchange policy, the monetary policy. These are important macroeconomic policies, but the the, the main. Bolivia, I, I, I can, I would like not to to to, to talk a, a lot because I don't know inside what is happening happening inside in Bolivia. Uh, I am very happy with the triumph of mass. I hope that this government will at least reinstall some of the policies implemented by, by Evo Morales. But uh, I don't know exactly what is the situation of Bolivia. Uh, you mentioned uh, Paris, the problem of debt. Uh, I, I don't know in depth, but it's, 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 I, I don't know very well what, what is really happening with, with the problem of debt. But of course, it's, it's a, a big problem in general the, uh, in, the, in, in our countries. Uh, and maybe now, uh, in sight of this crisis and this pandemic, only I will say two things. First, I think our countries uh, must respond. since the government has also positive effects. In Mexico has very positive effects. I think the majority of Mexican people is uh, okay with the idea that government, that I think that people in the government must have uh, a salary according to the situation of the people. And they saw very positive the, the idea of austerity in the government. But at the same time, you know, 
it has the other problem. You need to, to expense more in, in wealth. Neoliberalism destroyed all the wealth system during 30 years of government, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And, and then, first idea uh, I want to transmit for me is not uh, is not correct. It is not necessary to 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 increase more the uh, mainly the, the external the foreign debt. Internal debt is another is another matter. Maybe it's, it is necessary to to increase deficit and to increase debt. With what limits, I don't know. But more debt internal is, I think, a good uh, policy. More external debt is the worst policy we can follow. Is to 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 come back to lost the decade of, uh, of the of the 80s. Uh, but at the same time, there are many indebtedness countries. I think for the third world, the, again, the, the idea the, the, to cancel debt is, is necessary to, to, to reformulate. No? Cancellation of debt. Mainly in, in in the in the countries less developed of of, of our south. This is my my opinion about these points. Thank you. Thank you, Arturo. Um, just to remind our our audience that um, uh, this session is on. Uh, uh, whether the question of whether the, the crisis is, a, is a due to corona, the corona pandemic or longer trends in uh, the accumulation model of uh, the neoliberal uh, phase of capitalism. Um, for those that have tuned in just uh, after the beginning, uh, we have uh, another question that has come from uh, our Argentinian colleague, Damien Lomos, and it is a question uh, which uh, to which I also want to add, uh, this is one of my, one of my uh, questions that I had in mind after reading your paper, which will soon be published in um, Agrarian South, in fact. Uh, the, uh, the question by Damien is the following. Um, it concerns the dispute of, over natural resources South. He says that if the crisis of the 1970s was resolved, let's say, uh, through the fall in the price of, uh, of oil, military means and so forth. Uh, what can happen today in those uh, territories that produced, uh, you know, primary commodities? Yeah. Um, Professor Patnaik uh, from uh, JNU has also, uh, in fact, uh, Prabhat Patnaik, Utsa Patnaik uh, have, uh, reminded us of the relevance of these commodities, primary commodities in general, agricultural commodities. In of if deflation today oh yeah yeah i think you've you mentioned it uh the the activity of the central banks uh, which is uh you know has no precedent to the quantitative easing and so forth but how yeah, do you yeah. can you just speak a bit more about the uh, deflation okay then uh how to, 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 to start. Um, first, uh, deflation was a concept forgotten during many years. When people uh, talk about deflation, 
they were thinking in in the depression of the 30s then there was deflation now the problem is inflation is we we live since the since the 70s since the 70s of mainly this idea of uh, proposed by by main mainstream economics that the problem uh, was inflation of course the inflation during the 70s was very very strong uh, we talk even of stagflation as a combination of stagnation and inflation the decade of, of 70s then it, it follows the the policy followed by, by by the fed during Volcker times which was at, at the same time a response of the united states to to the to this crisis of the 70s uh, to the infl to inflation it mainly also to the devaluation of dollar and they start this very aggressive policy of uh, augmentation of of, uh, of the rate of interest in order to to stop inflation and at the same time to to to, to avoid more devaluation of the dollar no? that was 80s and since then uh, uh, the fight against inflation was the center of uh, of the economic policy in in the main capitalist countries no? uh, inflation is the enemy and then comes globalization of course financial globalization requires uh, uh, control of inflation uh, financial capital or financial uh, assets needs uh, stability of prices in order to to to, uh, to assure the valorization of capital uh, then during globalization this objective to control inflation becomes even more more important no? and then we forget what is deflation even uh, minsky one of the main faith thesis was that that contemporary capitalists uh, uh, can control deflation they accept of course as as Keynesian that deflation is is a very important problem sometimes during crisis more important than inflation for the operation of the system but they, they think that with the def, uh, fiscal deficit with uh, the role of central banks in order to 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 to, to become the the the, uh, the lender of last resort and the problems of of capitalists are solved it will it will happen again no so the famous book uh, contemporary capitals can control crisis because they have more instruments in order to to avoid this process of of uh, deflation but this was not true <laughs> we, we we have experimented deflation but no the the same deflation of the 30s of the past of capitalism because it's it's true what minsky said capitalism has most instruments in order to to fight deflation but to have more instruments don't 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 
don't mean, in my opinion, that deflationary forces are inexistent. They continue to, 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 to appear during uh, mainly the great, great, great crisis of capitalism. And that's the case in the 70s, since the 70s, and then to 2007, and now. And we have deflationary tendencies since the 70s. Is the same deflation than before? No, it's different deflation because it's different capitalism. That is the idea. That for the reason I, I, I take, I, I took the idea of Aglieta in the sense that deflation in, in present times is quite different than deflation in the 30s because effectively there exists more instruments to control deflation, central banks, fiscal deficits, etc., etc., etc. Yes, but at the same time, these tendencies are present. I, I take uh, 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 a concept from Aglieta in, 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 in the sense that deflation is deflation con counteracted by other factors. No? Is not an open deflation. Is a deflation counteracted for these counter forces. I don't know. I explain, but this is the difference I, I saw in the operation of deflation. Uh, that's all. No? Ah, the the primary commodities. How to to to? to. I think that this. Uh, tendency to deterioration of com uh, commodity prices is also uh, a law of, of the functioning of, of capitalism. Of course, as Previch noted since the beginning, uh, that not means that always primary prices are uh, uh, reducing uh, uh, permanently to, uh, in, in the system. There are some uh, periods of expansion of capitalism uh, in which these prices can increase. But in general, we can assume that, that this is a tendency present always in capitalism, mainly in the periods of great races. During the 30s, we have a deterioration of the terms of trade. In the, in, the, in the 70s, we have deterioration in the terms of trade. In other uh, periods of, of functioning of capitalism, no? uh, I don't think that uh, the princes, for example, of China, uh, his role as uh, uh, as uh, main uh, Como se dice, comprador en, en inglés, sorry. Uh, buyer. To buy, to buyer. <laughs> As buyer of primary uh, uh, products means that the, the this law don't separate more. Your colleagues in, in Brazil think so. <laughs> they think that the relationship with China, with the permit Brazil not to confront the deterioration of terms of trade. That is not true. Even China confront in some conjunturas and some conjunctures uh, this process. No? Thank you, Arturo. Um, the, as far as the questions are concerned, uh, do any of our panelists here have any Questions or any other the participants in the, um, among the the attendees? Do we have any further questions? Can you uh, perhaps uh, while people are we have another maybe twenty minutes or so? If uh, would you like to speak uh, a bit more on uh, maybe Mexico, the situation in Mexico? Uh, just a few words. What do you think um, the tendencies are? 
with uh, Lopez Obrador and uh, the possible change of government in uh, the U.S., how how are the tr the new trade deal? How are these things uh, working out? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I begin with the new trade deal. First, uh, of course, this new trade deal uh, signed with uh, Trump's administration is worse than the, f the first one. <laughs> Is more rest, is more limited to Mexico because it's more protectionist. Uh, is the, it is inside this general strategy of Trump trying to to recuperate uh, some activities to the United States to to deglobalize the American economy through this trade then it's worse than the former. What is the problem? Uh, Lopez Obrador is, is a, a government of change, I think so. There have been very important change in, the political, in political terms and also in, in some policies, uh, economic policies. But what is the situation during neoliberalism? The trade deal was very negative in many aspects to the function of the agricultural sector, to et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Many, many regressive changes in the functioning of the American, uh, Mexican economy, this articulation of the productive system and so on and so on. But the problem is that the only dynamic sector existing in Mexico after neoliberalism is this export sector. That means the export autos, the auto parts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then not to not to sing the the deal will mean uh, would uh, would mean uh, to <laughs> to close the the only sector who is which, which, which was dynamic in the American economy. Of course, it is necessary to 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 to, to apply other kind of policies in order to 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 recover autonomy. But it was very difficult for Lopez Obrador in the concept of our country, not to sign the trade deal. Then, uh, uh, López Obrador is the enemy of the Mexican oligarchy, not now, is the enemy of the Mexican oligarchy since many years ago. That is the reason because he was not president in 2006, it was a, a fraud. He won the election and the oligarchy organized through the government, the neoliberal government, then Vicente Fox and then Calderón to avoid that López Obrador arrive to the power. And then it's, it's, it's a, a government who has a very high level of support of people, even now. Even now with pandemic, even now with a political war uh, declared by this, by uh, at least one part of this uh, financial olig oligarchy, which is the hegemonic fraction of the bourgeoisie in, Me in Mexico, which is against the government of Lopez Obrador, at least some sectors. Well, you, I, I would say one part of the oligarchy say, said that uh, he can collaborate to, 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 to invest in some projects, and the other one is, properly uh, speaking, uh, with the media, the majority of media, salvo uh, some 
newspapers, las, la, la jornada, o some uh, radio stations and television uh, stations, one, two, three, but the rest, the majority of media are against López Obrador government. Uh, I, the, there is a, a political war against the government of, of López Obrador. But even in this context, uh, now the support of López Obrador is about 70% of the population. That, that, that uh, means a lot, I think, because with pandemic, with economic crisis, with political uh, fight, the support of the government is very, very high. What, which is, in my opinion, the, the main merit of, of, uh, of the government of López Obrador? The decisions to separate economic power from political power. That means uh, the, the political power was completely atrapado, como dices in English, atrapado, capturado. The political uh, power was cap captured completely by the financial oligarchy. It was not only the dominant class. They captured the state since Salinas de Gortari, Vicente Fox, and Felipe Calderón. There is no separation between political power and economic power. Need even political power and narco negocio. It was a a conjunction of interests of oligarchy, narco, etc. Now they, they are a, the, the a clear line of yes, just... separation, separation. One is the political power and the other one is the economic power. Of course, that is a process, but I have decision, there is a decision to, to broke this situation. No? And in my opinion, is the main merit of this administration. Thank you. Uh, I would have one more question, but let me go back to Archana. Archana, would you have uh, any 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 new questions for the comments? I don't really have a question, but I just wanted to pitch in by um, saying that uh, uh, Professor mentioned that. Uh, 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 the financial oligarchs have taken over political power. Perhaps that's the recipe for fascism, contemporary fascism. And, uh, uh, and I think that the contemporary crisis of capitalism cannot be sort of seen as divorced from that because capitalism is also surviving with the brute military power and the force that is, it is using on the multitude of the working classes. So, uh, uh, so I just think that, uh, I, again, let me reiterate, I think it was a very good class for me on the world political economy. But I also think that the opposite, the second leg of it, which is the people of these countries and their relationship with each other, and the kind of new internationalism that is needed to sort of oppose this uh, emerging nexus, I think we really have to think quite seriously about that. It's not as if, you know, because the Indian ruling class itself is so in, in international uh, or global that uh, it has tie-ups with the ruling classes of the North and even many other countries. So uh, the uh, working class alliances first within their national spaces. I think there's a lot of division there also. And then a vision, which is a working class vision of the world is something that is a crying need and maybe all of us who are experienced or who have experience of the various contexts need to come together and think about it. 
I don't really have a question. It was just a comment. Thank you. Thank you, Archana. Uh, there's, uh, I don't see any further, but I, if, I, if we have just a few more minutes, uh, Artur, can I just ask you one more? Yeah. Yes, okay. one more. Yes, one more question. One more question. Uh, we had just to have a few minutes. So just one quick question. The relationship between uh, the government of Lopez Obrador and uh, the Zapatistas has um, never been good and it seems to be getting worse. So can you speak a bit about that? <sighs> Difficult question. <laughs> No, of course, there is no good. I, I answered you, but I before want to, to 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 mention something that the professor said at this time: the the the, the necessity of an international re response to the crisis. No, if I understand well his his commentary. Uh, and I will take this uh, preoccupation in relation with the recent, recent, very recent changes in in in, in Latin America. No, I think that the the triumph of uh, of mass in Bolivia opened a new way to to reinstall some sort of uh, uh, alliance between these governments because. Uh, Fernandez in Argentina and Lopez Obrador in, in Mexico was very limited to 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 take actions. Uh, the field of uh, Latin American relation was was uh, filled by by the Grupo de Lima, La OEA, Almagro, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The, the the former uh, uh, intents of uh, or create a Latin American bloc uh, during Lula, Chavez, etc. Uh, almost completely disappeared. Now I think the, there are possibilities for more open discussion and relationships between these three let's call uh, left governments in these three countries. About Zapatistas and, and I think the difference is a difference of uh, the, the field of, of operation of Zapatistas on one side and Lopez Obrador government on the other side. Lopez Obrador is the national government. Zapatistas is a movement which many ideas about the future world, uh, otro mundo es posible, etc., etc., etc. Uh, it's very nice to, 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 to talk in these terms, but at the same time, this is a local movement. And there are many other uh, local movements, uh, peasants, uh, others, indigenous groups, etc., etc., et which fight for, for uh, how to say, for particular demands. And it, it's, it, it's very good. Okay. They, they, they fight for this. They will continue to fight. Now the situation is much better. One of the facts of the present government of López Obrador is there is no repression to any movement. That don't mean that it doesn't exist repressions. There are groups, there are paramilitares, many sorts of repression, but the national government is not re re applying repression to anyone. And now we have a level of uh, liberty of expression, for example, liberty of press, we, we didn't have before. Then there are two projects. One is the national, to solve the national problems, 
and the other one is a movement very genuine very important the, of an indigenous group uh, uh, organized by Zapatists, but they, the, the Robert is uh, apparently coincide in some in some things, but finally uh, the the strategies and the feel of action is is quite different. Thanks, Arturo. Thank, thank you, you very, very much, much. The, again thank, thank you very, you very much. much for the invitation yes it's always uh, good to see you and uh, hopefully we will see you more in our network as you know we've we, we of have, course uh, beyond these uh, series we have a journal and um, and uh, we try to promote uh, you know a, a debate a systematic debate which is tricontinental but also global at the same at the same time so thank you very much. It was really wonderful to have you. Uh, it was uh, illuminating, and it added it added to our discussions a dimension that we to this date we have not had in terms of uh, uh, the Mexican, the Latin American side, as well as uh, your own views on uh, the world political economy. Yeah, we've had uh, this type of debate already with uh, uh, Prabhat Patnaik. Uh, with uh, Sitsui and Kim Chi Lao in, 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 in China. So we do have, and, and also uh, Jayati Ghosh in India. So we have uh, quite a robust, a robust debate on uh, the, the tendencies in the world economy today. So to this, you have contributed in a very illuminating way. And we hope that uh, you will stay with us uh, in, the coming, uh, in the coming years. Yep. Of um, course, I will, so, be, I will be. Thank Great. you very so much. let me just um, uh, thank uh, our supporting partners who I mentioned earlier, uh, and especially to especially our tricontinental uh, logistics team, which has uh, always manages to do such an excellent job in uh, putting this together. That includes uh, Joseph Matai in uh, in New Delhi, uh, Nabajit Malaka also in New Delhi, Asha Chaudhuri Priyaka Kula in New Delhi. Uh, Freedom Maswe in uh, Zimbabwe, uh, Julio Cambanco here in Brazil. Yeah, that's uh, our team, um, and uh, we thank them very, very much. Our next session in the dialogue series will be on the 4th of November, that is one day after the US elections. Yeah, and uh, we will have uh, with us Professor Beverly Silver from Johns Hopkins University, uh, who is also the director of the uh, Giovanni Enrighi Center of uh, uh, World uh, Study of Global World uh, Affairs, uh, who will speak on the U.S. elections and the crisis of global capitalism. Yeah, so let's uh, uh, put that in our agendas and meet again in uh, two weeks to discuss the fate of our great and uh, declining superpower. Thank yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much to all. Take care. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for all panelists and attendees. Thank you.